I'm Brad Knox, and I'm going to talk about the empathic framework for task learning from implicit human feedback. Before I jump in, I want to mention this is work done in collaboration between Bosch and UT Austin. I and my, uh, my partner, Alessandro Alievi, are establishing a research group located inside the University of Texas for Bosch, uh, focused on autonomous driving and specifically reinforcement learning and imitation learning for autonomous driving. This work was done jointly with Yuqin Kui, Chiping Zhang, Scott Nikum, and Peter Stone. Yuqin and Chiping are the joint first authors for this work. First, I'd like to jump into what we mean by implicit human feedback. I'll use this example to illustrate. Imagine that he's interviewing the woman in the foreground uh, for a potential job. As she's doing the interview, she is probably watching the man's facial reactions, body pose, all sorts of nonverbal behavior to try to understand how she's doing and how she might modify her behavior in the interview to be more effective. This is something that we do very naturally. And the information she's pulling from we exhibit very naturally and very frequently, and, but you know, often in, in hard to interpret ways. This, this information is what we're calling implicit human feedback, where uh, to define a little bit more, what I mean is uh, feedback that is not intended to uh, teach or to influence behavior, but nonetheless contains information about how another agent is performing a task. The big appeal to me of implicit human feedback is that Although it can be difficult to interpret, it is a, a source of information that we are freely giving out already. And so this is a, a, a type of feedback that can be used without any additional cost on, on people, not without asking anything of them. You might have more costs in terms of adding a sensor you know, or more computation, that kind of thing, but no demands on humans, uh, human attention or time. It's really kind of taking information that's just kind of out there and being put out there and currently not being harnessed and using that to understand what people want and potentially adapt autonomous systems behaviors to do what they want. Let's kind of put this in our, our own framing. Who among us has not scowled at a robot vacuum as it bumps into your foot or gets stuck uh, under a couch or raised our eyebrows at our cruise control or shared choice words with automatic doors that aren't, aren't acting the way we think they should or reacted to the decisions that a driver has made. To ground this out in a specific application, uh, we're focused on autonomous driving in, in our group, um, although we are able to do this, this type of more fundamental research that uh, isn't only applicable to autonomous driving. Imagine you have a autonomous vehicle and it needs to stop at a crosswalk. You've already created an algorithm that can do that safely. So that the safety is not in question, but it could slow down at different rates. And the way it slows down, the deceleration profile likely is going to affect the experience of the riders and of pedestrians nearby. And so you could potentially use the reactions of these people, pedestrians or riders, to adapt the deceleration profile to create better experiences. Before I get into our framing of the problem, uh, more specifically in our solution, uh, I want to talk about some related work. First, uh, there's work by Arakawa et al., where they have an algorithm they call DQ and Tamer, which is a, a a mix of the reinforcement learning algorithm, DQN, and Tamer, which I developed in my dissertation, where they use an out-of-the-box emotion classifier uh, that classifies people's emotions based on a camera feed on their face. And though I think there's seven emotions that are possibly output, they just classify these emotions as positive, negative, or neutral, and map those to, they have a hand-coded mapping to, to Tamer feedback, uh, which I believe would be a, a plus one, a zero, or a negative one. Uh, there's work by Vivek Varia. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. He actually did this work during his master's thesis at University of Alberta. And um, he did it under Rich Sutton and Patrick Polarski. And he did work where uh, they use implicit human feedback uh, via learning a value function where that, that the facial expressions are used as input, um, and I believe as, as part of the, the state. So it's, it's kind of like additional state information for the value function. Guang Liang Li and collaborators uh, do something somewhat similar where they learn a model that predicts the user's tamer feedback from their facial expressions. And then these, they use these predictions of tamer feedback to augment the actual manual feedback to get, to get a richer uh, set of feedback and learn more quickly. I want to note that 
all of the cases above involve explicit teaching, training, and or at testing time. And those that do learn a reaction mapping, the, the last two, use both states and actions as input, uh, which is going to limit how well they can transfer their learn model to new task domains that have different state spaces and action spaces. I'm going to just briefly mention there's also work in brain-computer interaction that could be considered learning from implicit human feedback. Somewhat reiterating here, our approach is distinct in three different ways. One, we do not require explicit teaching or manual labeling by users. We, in our reaction mapping, we only use human reactions as input, which makes it so that reaction mapping potentially can be used in, in any task. Um, I say potentially, there's, you know, there's still some important instantiation details for that to be true. And the last one is we uh, let the data decide what task statistics to map human reactions to. So in the, the related work, some uh, one map to value, to state value, I believe. Uh, two of them map to tamer type feedback. And there's a lot of different things you could try to map to. And so we uh, take a more agnostic approach. Uh, I will say that uh, our, the framework we're going to propose, the empathic framework, delivers on all three of these, but the instantiation that I'm going to describe only really delivers on the first two. We're going to end up focusing on predicting reward in the instantiation, but the framework is, is general. Before I get into our solution, I'll talk a little bit about the, the problem. We call this problem the, the life problem, learning from implicit human feedback. And you could describe the problem like this. Uh, the problem is answering the question of how can an agent maximize return under a human's hidden reward function using information derived from the human's reactions to that agent's behavior. So you put this in a little bit different language. Uh, an agent is performing a task. The human has some you know, psychological, you know, in their brain, not observable uh, reward function that we assume exists. It cannot be observed, uh, but it has some influence over their reactions. And so we want to be able to use those reactions to uh, change the agent's behavior um, so that it's going to uh, have a higher accumulation reward according to this hidden reward function. Uh, this tuple describes a specific life problem. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief and unfortunately I'll just make the assumption that you already know about uh, market decision processes. So the the three items in the middle are the only ones that differ from an MDP. So notice there's no regular reward function. There's this hidden reward function inside the human that can't be observed. Uh, there's uh, the X superscript H. That's a set of possible observations of the human. Uh, so for instance, if there's a camera feed on a human's face, this could be the, you know, the, the space of possible pixel values. And then there's uh, this, this psi, which is uh, basically it, it says, given what the agent has done and the human's uh, reward function, what's the probability that they'll react in one way or another? Um, and so these all together describe the, the life problem. And, and I won't come back fully to this, uh, this, this formulation, uh, but the approach we take in a way is learning the, the reverse of this, this psi. Um, you know, I'm, I'm saying that fairly loosely, but psi goes from the trajectory in the human's reward function to the X super, superscript h and instead we're going to go from the trajectory in x superscript h to uh, you know in you know specific probabilities over the instances of the human's reward um you know and it can be other test statistics as well but in our instantiation it'll be human reward that's the life problem our approach to the life problem we call the empathic framework it has two stages the first stage in, involves learning a mapping, uh, a reaction mapping go that goes from these human reactions to what we call task statistics. I'll say more about that in a second. The second is using that reaction mapping and people's reactions to understand a task, to learn about a task. I'll go into this a little bit more detail here. All right, so uh, in stage one, where we're learning the reaction mapping. You've got the agent and the environment interacting uh, in the, the typical sense for sequential decision-making tasks. Uh, the human is observing and reacting uh, to what they're observing. Um, again, they are not controlling. They're not explicitly teaching. Um, and importantly, only in stage one, there's a full task specification. So we do know the reward function uh, for this task. And we incentivize the human to be aligned with that reward function. So we want this 
this hypothesized or kind of assumed internal human reward function to be as close of a match to the reward function in our task specification. And the way we end up doing that is we pay subjects uh, where the return of an agent that they're observing is, uh, I believe, proportional to their, their payout for being subjects. Um, so we got that task specification. And as the trajectory is being created, uh, various task statistics can be computed. So reward doesn't really need to, be, need to be computed, but that's the task statistic. You could compute the state values, the state action values, advantage, uh, zero or one for whether the action was optimal or not for that given state. And so that gives you a lot of different possible task statistics to, to store here. And uh, at the same time, these reactions are going through feature extraction. And so we end up with this data set that's a supervised learning data set uh, where the features that come out of the reactions are the inputs and the task statistics are possible outputs. And you can do supervised learning on a bunch of different task statistics and see in various ways which ones are being modeled more effectively than others. The end result of stage one is this reaction mapping, the mapping of reaction features to task statistics. And then here's stage two. You no longer have a task specification, um, but uh, a lot of things are similar. So you still have the agent environment interaction, a human observing and reacting, and those reactions are getting, uh, you know, features are being extracted from the reactions. And, but now, uh, at least in the kind of canonical version, the agent doesn't have any other form of feedback besides what's coming from the human reactions. And so the output of this reaction mapping might be reward or probability distributions over reward. It could be uh, something related to advantage or any of these other task statistics. And really, I, I might just say advantage there a shorthand, but in every case, I think we should be outputting probability distributions because of the noisiness and the uncertainty of this, this sort of feedback. Um, so with these task statistics that are being generated from the human reactions, we in various ways can try to assemble an understanding of the task or the behavior that's, that's, being, that's, that's been reacted to. And from that, we could change the, the agent's behavior, uh, hopefully improving the return that the agent is getting according to this, this hidden human uh, reward function. And we, you know, reiterating, we call it empathic, which stands for evaluative mapping for affective task learning via human implicit cues. Now I'm going to talk about, uh, for most of the rest of the talk, how we instantiate empathic. And first I'm going to talk about getting the data set to do the supervised learning. So we wanted to craft an observation session to gather rich, authentic data. Now here we're talking about uh, this portion of the, the schematic of stage one for empathic. And we're really trying to get that, that, the, the core data before computing task statistics and doing feature extraction. Okay, so here's what we created. We created a domain called RoboTaxi. We told people to uh, pick an autonomous vehicle to buy. And so they pick this skin. It doesn't affect the behavior. And then we tell them, I'm going to pause it here, sit back and enjoy being a RoboTaxi tycoon. Your RoboTaxi is going to go around town and pick up passengers and make you money with their fares. And you don't have to do anything. Um, but then what actually happens, I'll let it play again is we have a fixed policy that, at least in a slight oversimplification, is uniformly randomly choosing uh, among the different action types. So it's, so it's quite bad. And, and the video you're seeing is actually even worse than, than normal, which is just, just bad luck. Um, and so we're getting a kind of a rich set of different reactions. They're not just seeing, we're not just seeing people react to good behavior, but to, to very bad behavior. So the negative $5 comes when they hit a, a parked car uh, or when their autonomous vehicle does. Negative $1 for hitting a roadblock and they get $6 for picking up a passenger. So we get this, the, this reaction data set. Here's some samples of the reactions. And you can see some people are reacting quite a lot. Some people are almost, you know, almost imperceptibly reacting. And I want to draw your attention to the man in the red at the top. If you look at him, it's really hard to tell whether he's smiling because he's actually happy or if he's frustrated. Uh, I would guess frustrated. Uh, and in fact, I think 
we saw more frustrated smiles than than you know smiles in a positive context. You know, this is not an extremely easy problem for people or machines, and and so I think this is uh, one rough illustration of of uh, how it can be tricky, and, and therefore it could be good to have data. Um, and the, the right thing to learn for this person's reaction might be uh, not that something good or bad happened, but that there's you know close to a uniform probability over good or bad things happening. With this data set, we took a while to do human exploration of the data, and we did it in a few different ways. Uh, the first is we did something that we called the human proxy experiment, where the six co-authors, we all acted as if we were the algorithm. And the reason for doing this was to get very familiar with the data set and the problem we were posing for the algorithm, and also just to show that this was doable at all. And so what we did is, you can see up at the top here, uh, these are four frames of the game. And then on the bottom are four frames, but now the objects have been randomly anonymized. So each object type uh, was, was assigned one of three colors, and the agent's now just a circle. And so we just watched this bottom one, and we watched the person's reactions, and our job is to try to say, after watching a portion of the episode, uh, whether you know, which, which of these colors correspond to which object type. And more specifically, we end up ranking them. So you can see these objects. I'm going to use the objects and reward values somewhat interchangeably in this talk um, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, but we end up ranking the, the three colors by our inference of their reward values. So I'll let you actually take a try here. The correct answer is that the red was the very good, the positive six, uh, picking up a passenger. The blue was very bad, which is running into the parked car, getting a negative five. And yellow was the mildly bad, which is a negative one for hitting a roadblock. Uh, this person, I would say, was on the easier side uh, for interpretation. And people, some people are almost unreactive. So the, you know, the difficulty of this problem is often going to be specific to the person who is being observed. Here are the results of the human proxy experiment. You can see the Kindle's Tau scores for all six uh, authors here. I won't say anything about the, the ordering, uh, but the way to interpret these is, so Kindle's Tau uh, takes a ranking, so this is our rankings of the three objects by their reward values, uh, and compares it to another ranking. In this case, it's going to be the ground truth of their actual uh, ranking by reward values. And so with Kindle's Tau, a one is a perfect score, always getting the ranking right. And a zero means you did the same as uh, a random ordering, uh, or at least the expectation of a random ordering. And negative one is as bad as possible. You got to reverse every time of the right order. And you can see we're generally above zero. And one author at the top actually got uh, statistical significance, even with multiple testing adjustments. Um, and so the big takeaway here is not that we're better than random uh, or anything about our average performance, but rather that one author was able to do better than random. And so that indicates that the information is there in the people's reactions to, to infer information about the task. This gave us a lot of courage in the kind of the troughs of sorrow in the middle where we spent really like two or three months trying to get the, the supervised learning to, to really be effective which we did eventually, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. We also, the first two authors, uh, did annotations of the data, of these, these nine different types of annotations. You can pause and take a close look if you want. Uh, these charts, I'll just quickly explain what they are. The, the tall vertical black line is the onset of whatever reaction is being annotated. So for instance, the onset of an eyebrow frown. And the red, yellow, and blue are the three different types of uh, object types that were interacted with at different times around the onset of that reaction. So if you look at uh, eyebrow frown, uh, you end up, you can see that uh, around one second before, maybe two seconds before uh, an eyebrow frown, it's more frequent that you see uh, one of the two negative events happening than the green happening. 
So you can kind of look at these and, and get a sense of what each of them tell us about the relationship of people's reactions and these events that have different reward values. We found these useful, again, for really familiarizing ourselves with the data and choosing which direction to go in our, our model search. Now I'm going to talk about uh, how we actually do the supervised learning and then use the, the reaction mapping. Uh, but first, because that gets a little complex, I'm going to give an overview. So here's the two stages again. Uh, we've got the, the task visualization and these task statistics, in this case it's reward, and the subject reactions. We create a classifier. Uh, it says RL stat, it should say task statistic classifier. And basically that goes from the reaction mappings to probability distributions uh, over the reward classes or whatever the task statistic is. And with this classifier, which is the trained reaction mapping, we can then apply it in uh, an anonymized version of the task. Um, so now we're getting, this isn't specific to the empathic framework, but this is specific to our instantiation. So from here, from this slide on forward, be careful that we're talking about an instantiation. The empathic framework is much more general than, than what I'm talking about now. But so with the, these reactions to this anonymized version of the task, the reaction mapping is going to output a likelihood of each of these events having happened and having created those reactions. And we can do various things with that, which, which I'll explain. I'm gonna talk now about stage one, which is learning that reaction mapping. And first I'm gonna talk about the feature extraction to create the supervised learning samples. This is a little complicated, uh, but uh, just bear with me here. So here's, a, here's the game, a trajectory over time. You can see a representation of what's happening in the game where there's, there's no interaction with an object, a passenger's picked up, no interaction, no interaction, crashing into a car, and so on. We are interested in making a supervised learning sample in this illustration for this one time step, which is crashing into a car. Concurrently, there are these image frames of the person and note the frames per second are, are quite different. And they're beyond that, they're, they're asynchronous. From these frames, we do feature extraction for every image frame. And I'll talk about how we do that in a moment. And then we reduce the number of frames by aggregating them. So we go from 30 FPS to six FPS uh, by max pooling. Uh, so you know, generally about five frames uh, will go into making one aggregated frame that's of the same vector size. Down here, uh, this is kind of the same process, but from a different perspective. So here's all the, the image frames. To create this feature vector, we use OpenFace 2.0. It outputs a number of things, but the, the outputs we use are the facial action units, which are related to uh, a system that I believe Paul Ekman created, where it's trying, if I, if I understand correctly, it's trying to assess how constricted various facial muscles are. This is really good information, but uh, I've heard it characterized as, as very noisy as well when it comes from OpenFace 2.0. Uh, and then also it has head pose information. And we feed that into a Fourier transform uh, with the idea that we want to capture whether a person is shaking their head up and down or left and right and you know, possibly with certain speed. And so we end up with these, these different uh, types of features, one around the facial action units, these, these muscles, uh, and then one around the, the head motion. And uh, if we're interested in a specific, you know, we're, we're trying to make uh, the input, the features for the supervised learning sample, where we already know the reward class, uh, which is it's the negative six or negative five one. Um, and we have a, a predefined time window that we're going to pull uh, reaction-based features from. And all of those are going to, they're represented down here. So this is for one supervised learning sample. This is the set of aggregated frames in the window. And they're going to be flattened into two big vectors. And there's an encoding, and then they're con concatenated. And that's going to make the input for supervised learning. So now that we have these supervised learning samples, uh, I'll talk about the modeling. And the, so the missing part here in the diagram is the, that input, the, the features are given to a uh, multi-layer perceptron, and that is tasked with minimizing cross entropy for reward classification. Uh, we actually ended up having it uh, reduce entropy of both binary and ternary classification. Uh, I can talk about that in, in questions um, about why we think that was helpful. And then we also had the auxiliary, an auxiliary task where it was 
trying to reduce mean squared error uh, related to predicting uh, characteristics of the, the annotations. I believe that was just predicting for zero or one whether a certain rea annotated reaction was happening or not at any time. The auxiliary tests appeared to be really helpful, and so it's kind of ingrained in, our, in what we did. But then we actually tested without it and found some really good results. So we don't necessarily have to have uh, annotated data to, to do what we, we end up showing that we do. This is how we split up the, the data for training and testing and also validation, and, and we have a holdout set. Uh, again, I can get into detail in the questions, but I'll just say uh, each subject had three episodes they observed, and one episode was pulled away into a holdout, like hidden in a holdout set, and the rest was split into training, testing, validation, and we would do a different split for each subject, um, and you can see this here. This is, this is the split for subject K. Here are our results uh, after a lot of you know experimentation, trying to improve the validation loss, but not the holdout set loss. We save that for, for later. The main takeaway here is the dotted lines. So the gray dotted line is the cross entropy loss for the, the model's ability to, to predict these reward values uh, if the model always predicted the exact same probability distribution and then that distribution was, was the best fixed distribution possible, which is the training, the distribution of the, the labels and the training distribution. I should mention, I don't think I mentioned before, we're only predicting the three uh, reward, non-zero reward classes. Uh, so we're predicting the reward that comes when an object is interacted with. We're not including data for when, uh, when no object was interacted with. Now, if you look at the red dotted line, that represents the average validation loss of the models that are created for each individual subject, uh, but then average it together. And you can see that it's better than this baseline of the label distribution. Uh, so the reactions do seem to be helping, but it's it's hard to say whether it's helping enough to to say that we're confident that it's just not better due to randomness. From a certain perspective, this improvement from 1.1-ish to 1.05-ish or 1.06 really doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually fits pretty well with this problem of implicit human feedback where the feedback itself is very noisy. So you don't want a model that's going to be extremely confident always. And so you're going to end up with a lot of uh, you know, high cross entropy loss much of the time. And in fact, that label distribution level of cross entropy loss really is kind of the safe thing. So if, if the reactions are not informative, then the output should be somewhat close to that, that label distribution, uh, which we did choose to be close to, close to uniform. I think what matters more is this next analysis where we want to use this mapping to infer what the actual reward function is over many different uh, interactions within events. This gets us to stage two, where we have a, a trained reaction mapping, and now we're going to deploy it offline in the RoboTaxi training test. So we're, we're going to have three different versions of stage two. This one we're using already collected data of people reacting to the same data set that we already talked about. So here's a representation of what we're getting out of the reaction mapping. Over time, there's these different events where the agent's interacting with these anonymized objects. And from the reactions and the reaction mapping, we get a probability distribution over what that actual event was. That happens for many different events. Three are shown here, but it would be as many times as, it, as the agent interacts with one of these objects. We're going to look at just one of these events to see how we use it to update our belief over different reward mappings. From this event and the output uh, here, we can think about uh, so, so we've got these six possible reward mappings. Uh, just to kind of review here, there's, these are the three anonymized uh, object types, and those could map one-to-one -to, -one to the three real object types in six different ways. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six different mappings. And from this output here, you can get a likelihood of each of the mappings, an unnormalized likelihood of each of these mappings. And so the way this works is uh, we know the events, the pink event, so we look down the pink column, and for this mapping, if it's, if it's that mapping, then this event was the, the car crash. And so we look uh, for the probability that corresponds to the car crash, and that's the likelihood, the unnormalized likelihood of this mapping. And we do it, and so on. So all the dark ones are the, the actual likelihoods of, of, of those mappings, unnormalized. Using that over many different events, we assume they're, they're independent, and 
we can just multiply. So for this mapping, we just keep multiplying. We get the product of, of the likelihoods over all the events. And so we get this likelihood of that mapping over the whole trajectory. And we have six of those likelihoods, one for each mapping. We normalize that. And from that, we actually have likelihoods of each of the reward mappings from that trajectory. And we can also do this at any stopping point. So we could have, we could just be 10 seconds into a trajectory and have a few events and also pull out the, the current likelihood uh, for that. So we did exactly that for, again, this is for offline data. So this is actually from the holdout set, the episodes that are in the holdout set. Um, and again, we're looking at Kindle's tau value, where one means a, a perfect ranking of, of the anonymized objects by their reward values. And negative one is getting them totally backwards, zero is random. Uh, orange is our reaction mapping with the auxiliary task based on annotations, and then yellow is without it. And you can see that generally it's above zero, which is good. You also can see here the human proxy average, which I don't want to put a lot of weight on. But if you look at it fairly closely, and if, you, if I share the numbers, uh, we do better than the average co-author. We are not trying to say in any way that that's an, an important thing or that the co-authors represent any group of people in general. But uh, we thought it was interesting to see that there, there seems to be some correlation between how difficult one subject's episode is for our model and how difficult it is for humans, uh, but not, you know, not a perfect correlation. There's more correlation seemingly between the two models. Also, while I really am not asserting this in any way meaningfully, I still take some pride that the algorithm ends up doing better than, than us humans. The really important thing though here is at the bottom. So statistical testing shows that our model, both versions, uh, yellow and orange, with or without the auxiliary task, do better than a random guess at the ranking. So that's the big takeaway, is that we were able to use the model to harness these reactions to understand the task better than we could without the reactions. We did a second stage two version where we do online learning. So this is the same thing, except the data is coming from a live person who's sitting there watching the agent while the agent is using the information from the reactions to adapt its behavior. Here's a video uh, where one of the co-authors is, is illustrating how this works uh, in our actual experiments. Co-authors are not included. Uh, but what you can see here, I'll stop for a second. So you can see here, uh, this is with about two seconds delay, what the inference is of the probabilities of each of these objects being the object that was actually interacted with. And then this here is the belief of our reward mappings. And the two green ones are the ones, this one's the correct one, I believe. But this one's the one that's incorrect, but it still puts passengers as the best thing to get. Uh, so the two green ones are the ones where a greedy agent would be acting optimally. So I'll let it go a little bit further. But you can see already the likelihood for the two green ones are the highest. I think they'll go down a little bit again, uh, but end up still the highest. You can see here that uh, Yuchen, our collaborator, is not wildly reacting, but she is on the, I think, on the easier to interpret uh, side of reaction. But it, it can do fairly well with even much, much subtler reactions, as long as there are some reactions. If you're interested, you can go back and look at this. I think it's really kind of fun to look at how good it is. And sometimes it's really wrong. Um, it'll pick up a passenger, and the probability of it having been a passenger is, is the lowest of the three. But this is built in a way where really we're interested in the aggregated understanding of the task. And it's okay for it to be somewhat wrong in any one instance. So that really reflects, like we, we built something that fits the noisiness of this kind of uh, feedback. Here are results with 10 subjects. In the plot, you see return over time. So we only did 100 time steps for, for this. Uh, nine out of the 10 subjects end up with higher than the expectation for a random policy, a uh, higher return. Seven out of the 10 subjects, when the session was stopped, their maximum likelihood reward mapping correctly considers the passenger pickup to be the best. The first thing, the nine out of 10 is statistically significant. I think these are really positive results, but they're, I think they're actually pessimistic results. You know, because of the pandemic and a little bit of rushing, we didn't do everything that actually I think helps us that we had done with the data set I talked about before. So we didn't actually pay subjects for this part. And so I don't think their internal reward, uh, you know, if 
if we assume that's a thing, uh, is aligned as well as it could have been with the reward that this re reaction mapping was, was trained on. Another thing is that the expiration of the agent was probably lower than it should have been. So it may not have been gathering as much information as it could have been on how good the, the objects are that it didn't consider to be the best at that moment. The third version of deploying of stage two of deploying the reaction mapping that we learned uh, is putting in a new domain. Uh, so we take the reaction mapping that's learned in RoboTaxi and we apply it in this robotic manipulation task. So just to be clear, we do not train a reaction mapping for this task. The reaction mapping is taken from RoboTaxi, uh, but we apply it to people observing this task. The way this task is set up, the robot uh, executes one of eight pre-computed trajectories where the task itself is to put cans in the recycling bin and nothing else. And an episode's pretty short. It ends either with something going in the box, which results in a positive one or a negative one reward, whether it should have been there or not, or it ends with nothing ever going in the box. So that's a zero. So there's three possible returns, negative one, zero, or positive one for an episode. Here's another view from the subject's perspective. And I'll let you see a video uh, while I explain what we do here. Uh, so for reasons I, I, I won't get into for time, we end up, instead of using the reaction mapping's output as a probability, we call it a positivity score. And the way we get this positivity score is when the reaction mapping outputs the probabilities of the three reward classes from RoboTaxi, the probability of the positive one of picking up the passenger uh, is going to be you know, its probability. So it's between zero and one. And we just take that as a positivity score. And then over the whole trajectory of an episode, uh, we get the average positivity score. And we're able to rank episodes by their positivity scores that, that come from these reaction mappings. And we can co compare those rankings to the actual rankings by their return. Here on the right, you can see, uh, oh, actually one other thing is uh, there's eight trajectories, but each subject only saw seven uh, trajectories. Here on the right, I think these are all the subjects that had usable data. And this is their Kindle's Tau score for the ranking that their reaction mapping created. So you can see everybody did better than, than the expectation for random ranking. And some, you know, we're getting somewhat close to, to one. Another way that we look at this is we, for the eight type of episodes, the eight different trajectories, we take the average positivity score across all subjects and we rank by that. So we just end up with one single ranking of these, these eight trajectories. And you can see it here. Uh, it's quite good. The only thing that, and, and the color indicates the, the return. Uh, the only thing that's out of place is it's red bottle and it's only out of place by, by two spots. And by Kindle's Tau independence test, this is a, uh, a significant result. So we had three really nice results in stage two, testing our reaction mapping, one with offline data in robot, RoboTaxi, so same the same task that we trained in, one with online policy improvement based on the, the reactions in RoboTaxi, and then one, again, offline, uh, but in a new task where it's actually a physically present robot doing uh, manipulations of objects. To close out the talk, I want to mention three ways that we're simplifying the problem for now. One is this private experimental setting uh, reduces subjects' distractions. In real scenario, realistic scenarios, I think it's very common that people are going to have several things competing for their attention. And it might even be that the agent is not their intended attention target. It might be that they're reading a book and their robot vacuum is cleaning and they only really pay attention when the robot vacuum annoys them or something like that. And so that brings up this challenge of knowing when a person exhibits some reaction, knowing what they're reacting to, or at least being able to incorporate that, whether you know fully what they're reacting to, incorporate that into the model. Another one is we avoided the question of how people's behavior will change if they know they're influencing the system. I think there's this, this tricky thing where we want to be creating a solution for implicit human feedback, but if a human knows they can affect the behavior of the agent by their reactions, in many cases, I think we can confidently say in many cases, that's going to change their behavior in some way. And my hope is that it will change their behavior in a small enough way that it's not going to break the system or you know, maybe that then it'll just have to be further iterations on the design of the reaction mapping. Uh, another one is that we chose friendly tasks, both the robo taxi task and the human or the uh, the robot manipulation task, uh, in two different respects. One, 
the task for, for the reaction mapping itself involved three discrete reward classes rather than regression over all possible reward values um, or other stat task statistic values. And then also both tasks were what I would argue were pseudo bandit tasks in the sense that the state of the task didn't have a lot of impact on the return beyond the, the near term reward. A lot of reinforcement learning tasks involve trying to improve the state without necessarily getting any near term reward. Neither of these tasks have that characteristic. We want to hopefully within a few more papers, get this technique, this framework and a methodology for instantiating empathic to where it could actually go into products and services. And we have identified five key areas that we need to improve things and focus on. So one, we need more data, uh, 20 subjects is just not a lot of data. You know, in the deep learning era, we, we were able to leverage the open face, uh, 2.0 open source uh, toolkit, uh, and that was critically helpful, but I think we can do a lot better with more data. We're developing a, a mechanical Turk platform for, for gathering it. We also want to predict more types of task statistics. We focus mostly on reward. We did a little bit of work looking at other task statistics, but I think reward is going to have a limit of how, how effective it can be and in what kinds of tasks it can be effective. Another one is we want a wider range of tasks. So we're the, the next round we're, we're picking three tasks that we think are somewhat representative of different types of reinforcement learning tasks. I think that's going to force us to really sharpen the technique. And if you remember our usage of the reaction mapping in the robot task, I think I used the word hack. And we did show, I think very legitimately, that the reaction mapping contained information about how good behavior was. But the specific way we used the reaction mapping was inelegant. And really, we should be able to come up with one, I think, one way of creating reaction mapping where it's applied the same way in every task. The second to last direction here is to extend this to scenarios where people are attending to various different tasks, maybe primarily to one other task, but where distraction and competing attention targets are there. And the last one is just looking at more reaction modalities. I think that's a pretty straightforward, obvious one, looking at gaze, gestures, things like that. With that, I'll end my talk. Thank you so much for listening.